Good afternoon. Welcome to Managing Shifts in Community Resilience Priorities in Light of COVID-19. I'm John Cashmar with the Southeast New England Network, and we're co-sponsoring the webinar today. The Southeast New England Network focuses on training and technical assistance for stormwater management. Our vision is to build resilient ecosystems and connect communities through action, collaboration, and innovation. And our mission is to empower communities to achieve healthy watersheds, sustainable financing, and long-term climate resilience. You can find out more at snepnetwork.org. And the geography we cover is Southeast Massachusetts and Rhode Island. Um, I would like to point out, we will have questions at the end of the webinar. If you have questions, please, please add them to the dialogue box and uh, we will have uh, someone who's reviewing those and looking for questions at the end. I'd like to now introduce Joanne Throw. Joanne joins us from Bristol, Rhode Island. She's a, a core team member for the network, working on innovative finance and leadership development. Joanne is president of Throw Environmental, as well as a senior fellow at the University of Maryland School of Public Policy. Joanne's past experience includes serving as Deputy Secretary for Maryland Department of Natural Resources and Director of the Mid-Atlantic Region's Environmental Finance Center. Joanne currently chairs US EPA's Environmental Finance Advisory Board and is also co-chair of the National Stormwater Finance Task Force for the US EPA. We're also very pleased to have the Association of Climate Change Officers, ACO, co-host this lunchtime webinar series with us. ACO is the premier professional development organization for individuals addressing climate change within their organization. And we look forward to today's conversation. And I'd now like to turn it over to Joanne to get us started. Thanks, John. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, this is the fourth time you'd be spending lunch with us, so we welcome everybody. Dan Krieger, uh, you are the executive director of ACO, and you've been doing an amazing job bringing in a lot of people and working with me on this lunchtime series. We have two amazing guests today. Um, the topic, as John said, managing shifts and community resilience priorities in light of COVID-19. So we have very different perspectives joining us today. Um, the perspective one from Orlando, Florida, we have Chris Castro, who is the director of the Office of Sustainability and Resilience. Uh, so it, this is interesting, Chris. Um, you come with a very uh, diverse background in terms of the work you've done to date. So you've been an, uh, what they call an eco-entrepreneur, which I absolutely love that term. Uh, you are all about building sustainable cities and uh, you've had uh, your plate full for a little while. So we're gonna talk about that. Um, I, I read a few articles that you've written um, also, I noticed that your work, uh, you were the president of um, a nonprofit uh, and ideas, and you were moving things forward. You were building things about fleet farming. Um, you were also making an appearance in Pittsburgh to Paris, which is oh, pretty awesome. Yeah. So I can't wait to hear all that you have to say today. That's pretty, pretty amazing work you've done um, moving forward so far. And also Nancy Smith, um, Nancy, we are so thrilled to have you in light of all that is on your plate with the public health sector right now in the middle of this crisis. Um, so Nancy is the community engagement. Uh, she is the program manager for community engagement, Office of Public Health Preparedness at uh, Boston's Public Health Commission. So Nancy's background, you've run the gamut from covering everything in terms of family health, um, substance abuse, um, you have emergency uh, management preparedness, um, you know, working with so many levels at, at the community level, um, and you're all about building relationships. So we really want to tie what you've been doing, both of you, Chris and Nancy, with your uh, with your uh, careers, but also at your with your cities and get that perspective. But first, I want to turn to my uh, co-host here, Dan. So Dan, um, and you know, just for people to remind them, we've been doing this lunchtime 
uh, series for this is our fourth week, had some various topics. I've really enjoyed this. Um, our experience, our interaction goes back to Maryland. Um, our time in Maryland with uh, the Climate uh, Leadership Academy and all the work you've been really doing um, to develop a climate readiness. And you have also, since this crisis has occurred, you have hosted so many different town halls and coffee hours and you know really hearing from people around the country and specifically on many topics but specifically on their shifts what's been happening on managing all of these shifts in their climate priorities and i wondered if you can get us started by telling us what you've been hearing just give us a snapshot before we can um, turn to our uh, sure. city guests well, and and in fact, uh, one of our guests actually actually uh, helped inspire the topic for this particular webinar, and it was a conversation that Chris and I had about what was going on with his work about two months ago. Um, now, wow, time flies. Uh, where you know the the question, you know, there were questions like, you know, what is my role going to be with this city? Is it going to be what it used to look like, or uh, am I going to be asked to take on a completely different portfolio? Um, and what does it mean for the things that I was doing in February uh, in the context of this? And yet at the same time, if I shift myself over to the work that Nancy does, um, those priorities haven't shifted. Public health should never have been a lower level priority. That was always there. We're just, we, we're, we've, we've kind of rediscovered it in a way um, and and so there's kind of this interesting sort of rebirth to some degree uh, or or awareness awakening and in other areas it's it's looking at well how do we deal with the the tomorrow in the context of today we hosted in December uh, the first global congress for climate change and sustainability professionals Chris was a big part of that program and what we were aiming to do at the time was to bring climate change and sustainability professionals to together to address the, the key challenges that the field of practice was having as a whole, um, from elevating the stature of the leaders in the field uh, to advancing the recognition and the value of the field of practice and increasing the demand for those skills. And so we were having all of these conversations. We had, we had a steering committee of 50 some professionals from across sectors and roles shape a program all year round. We had a four day program that was built around a series of professionally facilitated discussions. We have this whole set of outcomes that we aimed to publish in March and COVID comes. And we're still trying to think about what those action areas are now in the context of, well, some of the things that we thought were emergent priorities in December now maybe are three year issues. And some of the things that are priorities today still align but have risen up in stature um and and so it's really interesting to kind of take and use this as an opportunity to recalibrate and and i i think a lot of people are and i think we're going to hear today from from nancy and chris how this has provided them that opportunity to recalibrate but i think everybody in this field is right now asking themselves how do I align what I'm doing on climate or sustainability in the context of either health or job creation? Because those are the two key priorities that we are hearing over and over and over. And if it doesn't tie into one of those two things, then it feels like that is not something we're gonna be working on right now. Um, and that's kind of what we're seeing and hearing through months of these interactions tying back to the conversations we've been having frankly for 12 years as a field thanks dan i think it would be great dan if we start maybe better understanding what nancy and chris do in their job so nancy give us yep. a snapshot of uh what your job as program manager is like in the community okay so um my everyday um, job is about get ready be safe stay healthy and creating relationships inside in, in all the 23 neighborhoods in the city of Boston. We're also very fortunate that um, this program also has gotten funding from Homeland Security. So I also support other regions in the city and around Metro Boston, which includes Cambridge, Somerville, Revere, Quincy, uh, Everett, um, Wem or Weymouth, and uh, Brookline. And so with that, 
it allows us to actually be able to do a lot of, and I'm going to use this word, cross-pollinate with programming to get people ready, which is a which is a simple thing that FEMA's always done, right? The public safety side of it, which is stay healthy, which you know people say, oh, well, we want everybody to learn how to do CPR. I'm just doing a general overview of some of the things that people have had out in the market forever with these get ready uh, emergency programs. But our program was very unique because it actually added um, a stay healthy portion of it, which allowed the public health piece to be inserted. And then, um, like I said, in 2016, I had an opportunity to partner with um, another city agency that allowed this uh, program to grow into a climate related issue. Because basically when you start talking about emergency preparedness, the flip side is like, okay, because of climate. So you had individuals that were wanting to know about sea rising. Okay, so if I have to evacuate, what do I need to have? So it was like, these programs kind of started running hand to hand with each other because you can't talk about any form of adaptation without actually getting people prepared for what they need to do in all facets of that getting ready, being safe, and staying healthy. Uh, so, Chris, give us a snapshot of your position. Yeah, so. Um... I am at the city of Orlando. I direct the Office of Sustainability and Resilience, and I've been here for the last six years. And ultimately, the charge um, is to transform Orlando into one of the most environmentally friendly, socially equitable and inclusive and economically vibrant cities in the country. Uh, and as you can imagine, in that definition, it's really about how do we integrate the triple bottom line of people, planet and prosperity into everything that we do within Orlando. Uh, and and so the last six years I've had, I'm a kid in a candy shop. Uh, for those who know me, I'm extremely passionate about this. And this was a perfect position for me to get into um, because really I'm an in-house sustainability consultant. I often describe my role as, as, as that because what we do every single day is help our departments and divisions throughout city operations, whether it's police, fire, planning, permitting, streets, stormwater, neighborhood relations, you name it, all of them in integrating sustainability into our operations, into the services that we provide to our residents. And in addition, then look externally at how do we integrate with the utility and the airport and the transit authority and our academic institutions and our overall business community and residents, all to create this cultural transformation towards sustainability. Now, Orlando is one of the fastest growing cities in the country. We had uh, about 1,500 people moving to Orlando every single week, uh, and this was pre-COVID. We still are seeing significant um, movement into Orlando, and in addition to people coming to live, work, and learn, we're also the most visited destination in the Americas. Last year, we had 75 million people come to Orlando to visit. Obviously, we're in a new normal. And so that all um, could potentially change. But, but I mention that because as being in this growth spurt that Orlando is in, in, in our kind of trajectory, this notion around sustainability is becoming so much more important. And so under COVID, we're beginning to see some changes. And I look forward to diving into that in this conversation. Thank you. So uh, Nancy, I'm gonna shift back to you. Um, so we're managing shifts in community resilience priorities, all right? So that's our title for this conversation. And you know, Dan said when he just opened and he said, your position hasn't shift, shifted, public health shouldn't shift. And so yeah. I wanna go back to you and hit you up with that, has it at all? You know, it seems to me it evolves every day, it changes every day. Um, based on the priorities of what's going on in the city. So talk a little bit more about that. Okay, so I'm, I'm, I am gonna step back just a little bit um, prior to uh, COVID-19. So um, the New England area itself, um, basically for so many years, have just been worried about Northeasters. The snow is coming. Oh, let's go to the store and just get everything. And, and they've also had this, I'm going to just be very nice, a luxury of like, uh, especially in the in the Boston area, the amount of times that electricity would go out would be very, is, is, is few and far between, all right? You may have little 
pockets of different places. But overall, the city infrastructure for snow is solid, all right? And so then we had that wicked storm that came through in 2015 mm -hmm. that really made all of us like this. I'm just gonna like, oh, oh my God, you know? We had Winthrop, Quincy, all of these beautiful places, all the coastal line was getting us, things were happening that they've never ever seen in their whole lives. It's like, and you, and so it allowed this kind of, I'm gonna just say shake up a little. And that shake up actually um, positioned us into a better idea about what things were gonna be doing winter wise. And then on the other side of the house, we kept seeing, you know, the temperature going up and all the all the information is coming out, the heat is coming. And then last year we had a wonderful opportunity to partner with uh, the Museum of Science through this program called Wicked Hot. And the data that came out from that has really allowed us to uh, put everyone, with, you know, transparency to the to the community. Like this is what's going on. And I think that when you have a mayor who believes in climate. Mayor Wash is in 100. He's all about uh, supporting um, new information. We've had, um, we have divisions inside of the city of Boston that is just growing. And I think that when you have that support from the top level, it allows us to actually be able to continue to do the work we're doing. I mean, my day is definitely not the same because I'm on virtual mostly, but it still is supporting the community um, virtually and also by little old school. Hello on the phone. Uh, my first thing that I do want to tell you is that I went back to checking in with my neighborhood association groups because they're ground. They're they're at the bottom. They they know what's happening on every street level. So when we first started this program, we invested the time with the neighborhood associations, right? So that allowed us also to be able to create a platform in order to have them do a buy-in as well with climate change. Because so you have to invest in education, in, in educating people. And I'm gonna give this a, as an example. What happens in East Boston, which is rising seawater, rising tides, high tides, the folks in Mattapan are like, yeah, so, but I wanna know more, more about why I'm getting groundwater into my basement. That's okay that's happening in East Boston, but this is what's happening in our neighborhood. So with that um, idealism, you really have to create a parallel of discussion that is really block by block. And I and I, and I, when I mean block by block, it could just be neighborhood by neighborhood in regards to what their concern is. And so old fashioned, during this time, all I did was just shot a few emails out to people. They were very happy to know that I was Cause you know, one to just check in, and then that's when I started finding out. Guess what? They're all doing these virtual uh, neighborhood association meetings, and so yeah. I get invited to all these things. And and one of the ones that happened last week uh, was pretty cool. The mayor popped in, and it, so he's popped oh, in. That's <laughs> terrific. Yeah. <laughs> so. Well, thank you. That's terrific. Now, uh, for Chris, you know what? What about uh, community resilience? If if you're saying that Orlando is you know, stepping up to be that smartest, most sustainable city in the United States. What about resilience in, in light of uh, this pandemic? What's the yeah, reaction? Most, shifted? most definitely. And and over the last couple of years, we've we've tried to integrate this work around sustainability and resilience into the organizational structure and, and have created this new office of sustainability and resilience. And, the you know, uh, resilience is a broad term, as most people know, and uh, quite frankly, it what you know, global pandemics weren't a part of the scope or the focus originally. And I think that that's one of the things that has now started to change, is really looking, expanding uh, kind of our understanding about what community resilience means. Um, you know, we have over the last number of years tried to in integrate uh, equity as a core focus in the work that we're doing and have that lens so that any policy or program we're implementing, you know, comes forward with with those who are least fortunate in mind first and trying to address their needs and insecurities. And now what I'm, I think we're beginning to see is in addition to equity, um, this notion around health being the focus of defining sustainability. So environmental health, public health and economic health 
are another way of saying the triple bottom line of people, planet, and prosperity, just with this notion around health. And I think we're going to begin to see cities in our communities pivot the focus towards health, public health, and equity um, in this light, you know, in this new normal that we're in. Um, you know, when we start also thinking about resilience, another thing comes to mind, and that is, is your institution prepared to work remotely in times of any given disaster? Right? Are you prepared to lift up digital tools and continue your operations remotely? And that's a big question at whether or not your business is resilient or your institution is resilient to any given shock or stressor. So now we're starting to think not just about your, you know, are we getting food and, and necessary resources, but can you continue to operate your business or your government or your organization in that same light? Um, you know, I think Dan, you know, hit it on the on the head with saying that this economic development and jobs are gonna be a, a very strong theme in addition to health. And so we're starting to, it's not that those weren't uh, a core part of what we were already doing. It's, it, it's actually part of the message that we lead with economic development and job creation it, it is the reason, you know, one of the major reasons we feel the importance of working on sustainability. And so we're just gonna have to prioritize that further, right? You talk more about the economy and about people and not less about the planet, but making those linkages for people to understand that it's not siloed that this is very much a holistic approach and that we need to we need to begin addressing it in that in that respect and so i don't see my role changing very 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 much away from developing internal and external policies and working on driving forward mayor's key priorities uh, but i do think that the approach and how we go about communicating these efforts will change and they'll be focused again more on equity more on health and more on economic development and jobs so chris to that point one of the things that we've seen in the in the climate space is the 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 sensitivity that we have with food uh to to uh, chronic and acute stresses um but we've also seen the massive waste that the way mm. we handle food in this country with a fifth uh, of our food ending up in landfill um uh, i'm sorry it's more than that 40 percent of the food we yeah 40 percent from farm to fork is wasted and then a fifth of our emissions um are uh, in landfill are from from food um mm -hmm. I mean, these are massive massive numbers but you're starting to see a shift in how you use land in the context of food, which correlates to a shift in priorities. We see long lines of people who can't get food right now, yep. not to mention some failings in the food supply chain and distribution that are impending or already happening. How is that shift manifesting itself in the context of your work? And Nancy, I know you have some insights on that too. Yeah. Yeah, really good point. Um, so local food systems is one of our seven core focus areas. And I, I didn't really mention those before. Um, but the local foods has been critical. And so we've been trying to figure out what are ways in which we can enable more urban agriculture. We can encourage people to grow food. So we've done things like enabling front yard agriculture where you can okay. grow 60% yeah. of your front lawn as an edible landscape. It could be fruit trees, it could be, in, it could be row crops, it could be raised beds. We have enabled that. And, and we have a significant amount of residents who you know, are growing food. Uh, in addition, we've enabled backyard chickens and apiaries so people can, um, um, raise their own, you know, grow their own eggs and, and, and honey. Uh, we have all, and then pivoted to looking at public land. And so we have a program called Grow a Lot that's about turning vacant public land into edible uh, landscapes, into urban farms. And, uh, and now we're beginning to see that because of that capacity that was built around enabling this food production, that we've been able to meet uh, specifically those that are most vulnerable with healthy, nutritious foods as we supplement with our food banks are providing, which are often non-perishable foods and, and not as nutritious as it could be. And so, and so what we're beginning to see is those efforts that we laid the foundation for are now allowing us to, to address food insecurity in a different way. My office kind of stepped in very early to begin aggregating the produce grown at community gardens, the produce that's being grown at our convention center. We have these vertical hydroponic towers and every single week thousands of plants being grown. So we're taking all of that. We're taking, of course, the plots, the grow a lot plots. All of that food then is now being donated and supplemented with the food bank. And we're doing that on a daily basis. I have staff that is literally out there getting this produce, harvesting it, cleaning it, processing it and delivering it. And so that's an interesting space that we weren't uh, expecting to fill in this time of crisis. But because, again, of that capacity, we've been able to address it. 
And then very quickly on the food waste side, I think that's a really important piece that, you know, 40% of the, the food that's grown in this country is not eaten, often ends up in our landfills and contributes to the climate crisis. So we've instituted two really important programs. One is we're now encouraging that homeowners um, divert their food waste at home through a backyard composter. We now provide free 80 gallon composters to every resident in the city of Orlando that wants one. They go online, they fill out a form, very simple, and in a month or less, we deliver it assembled so that they can begin to divert that waste. That's important from an economic standpoint because it minimizes how much taxpayers spend to tip that waste into the landfill. We don't own the landfill. So if we can minimize how much is going into the truck, we can save people money. And that's one justification. And the second one is at the commercial side of things, the hotels, the restaurants, conference spaces. Uh, we now have a program where we fully divert and take it to a waste to energy plant to create energy. And again, trying to address the food waste component and the food security aspect kind of simultaneously. Uh, so Chris, before Nancy, I'd let you follow up with that. Uh, Chris, is there, I have a question from one of our listeners and um, on your front yard gardens, do you have a toolkit that's already developed uh, for the empty lot program? Is there something that people can start looking at? Because I know I've read your article on, you know, uh, the farming, uh, fleet yes. farming, but do you have any toolkit or something that some of our people here in New England could use? So I was really passionate about this aspect of turning neighborhoods into agri-hoods and trying to bring food production into our communities great. and hyper-locally, not only hyper-locally grow it, but hyper-locally sell it. And so I ended awesome. up um, getting together with some friends. And as you mentioned, I'm an eco-entrepreneur, so I've started a number of nonprofits and companies. One of them is Fleet Farming, F-L-E-E-T farming.org. And this organization did just that. We approached homeowners with this model to say, hey, if you give us your land free of charge to the nonprofit, we'll come in, put all of the inputs to build, grow, harvest, maintain. The homeowner can keep as much of that produce that they can eat, and we take the excess and sell it to SNAP eligible farmers markets throughout that community. So it's it's literally hyper locally grown and distributed and sold. And we now have over 60 homeowners that have offered up quarter acre, half acre lots and growing that food and hiring people and employing them to do so. And so check out fleetfarming.org. Uh, we do have a toolkit. We do have more information about how you can take this model and expand it to your community. I love it, Chris. Nancy, you were going to follow up on the ag piece. Uh, uh, listen, I listen. I don't know if I can follow up on that. I mean, this is <laughs> fantastic. Oh, I, I sit here, you know, uh, I can tell you that uh, I, from the standpoint, I'm going to go back to Mayor Menino. Um, one of the he's passed on, but during his tenure um, as mayor of Boston, uh, they had a picture that showed his open space before he arrived and before he left. He was adamant about gardening, uh, opening up these wonderful spaces so people could start growing food and all kinds of things. And so Mayor Walsh has actually continued on with this. So you do see uh, more and more people in the Boston area doing more urban farming, right? We would probably like to see more of those spaces opened up for urban farming, but there's also this big uh, how can I say, I can't say that it's a, uh, there's a pressure to create more affordable housing. Mm. So mm. what happens is when these locations come up, the community is the one who determines the priority. Mm. I'll use this for an example in my own neighborhood. I live in a Grove Hall area. Now you guys hear the word Grove. That meant that at one point this was a farming area, right? There's different places that we found living here as just a resident that there are pockets of all of these um, trees that are apple trees and pear trees. And I'm going to give you a funny story that happened. We actually went and got some of these apples and one of my neighbors was like, what are you doing? I said, these are apples. She said, nobody eats those apples. I said, there's nothing wrong with these apples. And she said, I've been living here all these years and nobody will eat those apples from those trees because they think that something is wrong with these trees. There's nothing wrong with these trees at all. But mm -hmm. what is going on in our community is, is that urban dwellers haven't had this idealism of being a farmer 
And so there's little small ways of educating them in growing uh, stuff like in shopping bags, you know, in these very small little areas, you grow the, you know, right in your little shopping bag. And then the other thing is because we have such a short uh, growing season, uh, you know, a lot of the folks who are planting, um, they're planting things now. Like I, I think one of the ones that we looked at was looking at vegetables that can mature like in 65 days mm -hmm. because, you know, just because of the maturity date. But I think um, going from a bigger picture about what the city is doing is that I know that we do have some uh, hydroponics uh, locations that are uh, in one of the neighborhoods that is recently, uh, they just recently purchased uh, or, or they were leasing this land, but the growth has not happened quite like how it's happening in, um, in Orlando. And I think it has a lot to do with, like I said, they're voting. They're voting for the space. If you say you want open space and then the community votes and says, we want affordable housing, kind of sure. lose out. Some of the things that I've seen, even in my own neighborhood, where they'll create housing and they'll put like open space in the middle of the apartment units, which mm -hmm. is like yeah. an old fashioned way of how they used to do things a long time ago, instead of just an apartment building and then just all concrete. Uh, so that's 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 what's happening. It's it's more so of then, a I'm sorry to cut you short, but I think this speaks to to a, an opportunity to align some things here because the the one you know Chris was talking about the importance of education and engagement and you were too, um, but there's there, there's a housing need, there's a food desert issue in a lot of communities and 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 also this could be a job creation engine, and it strikes me that, that it doesn't have to be one or the other. But I think the shift in priority that's taking place is figuring out how to frame it today in the context of serving all of those needs at once and designing systems that aren't one or the other. Sure. And, and I think that's the yeah. thing that if we do better, that that you then it is going to be responsive to all of those needs. But if we treat them as we're going to do this one thing at the cost of the other, well, it's not really, though. Yeah, and there, there, to, to build on that, there could be, you know, we now have standards for affordable housing that require us to not build the worst building by law to the full yeah. building code, but for us to go above that and be more efficient so that those dwellers who end up occupying it don't aren't burdened by the energy or the utility side of things. And we've seen that often, you know, very often where somebody has an affordable rent for their apartment, but they're burdened out from the utilities because that apartment hasn't been upgraded by the landlord or it's using very inefficient air conditioning and water heating systems. And as an, and so we now have this enhanced notion where if we're going to use CDBG or SHIP or home dollars, these are all federal and state uh, housing dollars, uh, that we have to tie it to some form of efficiency and, and green improvement. So we now have this guide for affordable housing. And part of it is looking at food production on site. I agree that if we build an affordable housing complex, ideally we have a community garden for those urban dwellers at that right. site in that courtyard where they can actually yes, grow food and meet their own needs locally. And so I do think that there's parallels that we could be, that it could be made. So it's not one or the other, but it's yes and. So I just want to mention, like, we have um, a lot of new construction going on. Boston, uh, someone made a joke one day and said to me, if we got a chance to look at the crane report, there's a, you know, it shows like how many cranes are up, uh, we'd probably be really shocked and scared. But that means that the construction is happening, but also in the sense of like the placement of people and making sure that we do include um, affordable housing in most of these locations. I think that one of the things that has been um, concerning is that we have an older stock of housing, older ho um, housing stock. So I'll give you an example, even what happened with my own home. This house was built in 1898, all right? So when I got ready to uh, have insulation put in, I had to actually uh, have the wiring updated, okay? Hmm. Which meant... Uh, and wiring is not included in any of the, uh, we have this program called Mass Save, what where you get, it? you know, for homeowners, you get a little bit of this to help, uh, you know, to offset costs. But for me, I had to pay the money for electrician to upgrade the house in order to get the blown in insulation. All right. So what we saw in the city was that there were certain neighborhoods 
that were taking full advantage of this new program that the city had and there were other neighborhoods like the one that I live in were not. And part of it has to do with the older stock needs to have the upgrade of electrical work before the blown in installation. So going back to the table and looking at how those dollars can be spent and looking at partnering probably with um, uh, the unions uh, in order to get some special deals. I know that they did some pilot programs for seniors that they brought their, um, you know, their electric, their electrical uh, systems up to date so that they could get um, the installation. So looking at that across the board, how it can help all of the older uh, neighborhoods with the older homes to do that. Well, I want to shift now. Um, there's a couple things that I wanted to make sure we had time to discuss before we take some of the questions that people are sending in. So uh, first of all, Chris, we, we, we're talking about, you know, the opportunity to continue on a path of resilience, uh, preparing for uh, um, climate resilience. Uh, and we're talking about economic growth economic development and tying jobs together with our plans. Now, you and I had this conversation um, recently and you were thinking that, hey, there is no reason why we can't continue to double down on our efforts and still continue to make places like Orlando and all the things you are doing for all the plans you are putting in place, all the policies, and why can't you attract you know, people who are leaving San Francisco because it's just too expensive and you are taking resilience and putting all of these activities locally that people will be attracted to. So talk a little bit about what that means to Orlando in light of dealing and recovering from COVID-19. A hundred percent. And, you know, every city in this country, especially now, is trying to better understand what our future looks like from an economic standpoint and how how do we go about attracting the creative class and the talent that ultimately will drive business development to 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 occupy your city and to continue the economic engine and you know what we've what we've identified is that investing in sustainability and as you mentioned doubling down on it especially now in this time is one of the most important strategies we should be looking towards in our communities to create jobs, to continue to uh, reduce our impacts on the environment, on the climate crisis, and at the same time, improve public health. And we don't have to give, give up any one of those components. We just have to reorient and prioritize how we go about advancing uh, what we wanna do in our communities. And, and I think that we have an opportunity now Many people, as we're talking about, you know, San Francisco and other cities on the West Coast that may be starting to be, you know, priced out of their current uh, locations are looking for places to move to and to migrate to that still have the same type of culture uh, around uh, environmental stewardship and, and equity and public health. They're, they're looking for those cities that are, uh, you know, embracing walkability and bikeability and um, alternative forms of transportation. And they're, they're looking for a place to raise their families that is also in a environmentally healthy location as well. And this is an opportunity, I think, for our communities across the country to, to again, revisit our comprehensive plans, our land development codes, and our processes and how we go about governing our cities to attract, to be more attractive and to really integrate uh, this notion of the triple bottom line into what we're doing. And so I, I think it is a true opportunity. We are, you know, I mentioned earlier, I, my position, my priorities haven't necessarily pivoted. We're still working on charting forward the goals we've set out. And, um, you know, this in conversations, you know, here with, you know, as we're going through budgeting and with leadership, you know, I'm hearing encouraging remarks from leadership and saying that because we've focused on these efforts, we're actually more resilient than we than we would have been if we did not do this, start this journey 10 years ago, right? We're, we're now, we've seen it on the food side of things. We're seeing it also on the economic side of things. And I, you know, I, I hope that other communities look towards sustainable development as a framework for them to, to really jump on or, or kickstart if they haven't already. So uh, thanks, Chris. Um, Dan, did you have a question? Because I've got plenty and I want to keep keep us moving forward, but I don't want to cut you off. 
No, not well. There's some interesting comments from things that have been said that have been teed up by the audience that I think are worth referencing. I don't know that they're questions, but I want to call it out. Um, so, um, and I had this exact same thought. So Deborah Johnson had commented that that um, if we start to see a reduction in office space demand, as some some entities start to recognize that telecommuting actually works for their business or for a portion of their business but that actually it's it's really interesting because there's an there's a group of people who are arguing right now oh great look everyone's staying home look how cleaner our air is and yeah. and we should encourage more of it well there's some ripple effects of that if you tell if if 30 of office space suddenly stops being used permanently then the economics of real estate in that have just completely changed <laughs> What can you do with it? And you may have space that can be used for housing as a result. You may also have space that can be used for urban farming. And by the way, when we talk about urban farming, let's not assume that urban farming only applies to a big city environment, because really what we're talking about is creating food growing capabilities in yes. places where you would normally have either commercial activity or yeah. residential activity, but not farming. Right. Um, and I, I think Deborah's point is 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 really spot on that. Um, the other one now does lead to a question, um, which is about behavior. Um, uh, one of the questions that came in is, um, uh, and this is really for, for Chris, but I think this will apply to Nancy as her feel with the communities as well, is, okay, so you're growing some food now um, and you're growing it in your home and a year or two, things start to resemble the old normal and people get tired and they don't want to grow their own stuff anymore. Um, and yeah. there's, there's an interesting question about how do you not just get people to do something today because things are difficult, but how do you actually make this a norm? And, um, and that's a distinction for people growing food in their homes in the residential area versus you you as a city or as a government creating a local growth activity that is staffed not by somebody who happens to be living there um, right. and i just want to know if you guys have been thinking about that and what sort of things you would be feeling from what you've heard in your communities at the neighborhood level well i think the point is critical that this is an opportunity to have this paradigm shift in behavior or in our thought processes that will hopefully chart our path in a more responsible and a cleaner and a more sustainable direction right so i think that there is an opportunity under covid maybe the silver lining of people now reflecting on themselves and how they live their lives a little bit more about the food that they're getting and where it's coming from which may have this ability of, of creating this transformation i often say that we have to make it fun. We have to make this mm -hmm. uh, an activity that you look forward to, where yeah. my daughter drags me out every single day to go to the garden because <laughs> she wants to go and get her Everglades tomatoes and like chomp on them. And so, so it's to the point where it's fun for her. She's like, this is an activity. I have to go outside with my dad and we're having fun outdoors and she's picking up bugs. You know, so the, the thing we've done with fleet farming, and this is, you know, fleet's not the only organization, but as an example, personally, we've done these um, every weekend we host what's called the swarm ride for fleet farming and this is a volunteer bike ride where we emulate bees swarming around a community on bicycles and we go house to house that has given us their lawn and we maintain the lawn for them and we have this ongoing edible education experience we call it where you literally go around learning how to grow food you're trying the food as you're as you're maintaining it as you're harvesting you're learning how to harvest lettuce which some people have never done and and at the same time you're also helping to build food resilience and, and food security in that community and so we've made it fun to the point where now we have 30 40 50 people every weekend coming out a grandparents and their grandkids coming out on a bike ride together outdoors and growing food and it's become this event that people look forward to in this activity. And I think there's other good examples at how we can make living more sustainable uh, a fun thing to do and something that hopefully becomes permanence beyond just this shock that we're facing under COVID. But, but Nancy, I'm gonna follow up with you because the communities, the neighborhoods you're working with, there's such diversity in the neighborhoods and you know, social, um, the, economic, the language, uh, the cultural. So how do you take all that you are 
trying to get the public information out, you're trying to stay with the community, understand their demands, and, and how are we transitioning? How are you transitioning your role and your work and managing that process to continue on this path? So um, early on, um, when we've gotten funding um, from, actually from, the, from uh, the Homeland Security, our program, Get Ready, Be Safe, Stay Healthy, is actually in 11 languages and also in Braille and MP3. So, wow. yes, and so because I follow a true FEMA policy of the whole community, the whole entire community, so my, my relationships are layered in many different ways. Like I'll give you an example. Uh, one of the things that's happening with um, uh, the Disability Commission. We uh, recently did a event that um, was considered to be a conversation with the community. And because I'm already layered with them, I, you know, I call them and I say, listen, we're gonna be doing this. Um, would you like for us to have a breakout room you know, for American Sign Language? And uh, she said, well, aren't you doing also for this particular one is in Spanish? I said, yeah, we're gonna do a breakout room for Spanish. And what she decided was like, I think what we would like to have is an event on our own uh, so that we can make sure that because um, the capacity of doing these programs to get information out to different individuals, sometimes I have to break it up instead of having all the languages, which we did old school, the old school, no, denom no language is dominant than the other, which mm -hmm. means the old school, uh, uh, trans translating English, Spanish, English, Spanish. Everyone who went to this event were so taken back by using that old technique because a lot of times what happened now in our new, our new normal, well, our old normal, we could just put earplugs in, right? And the language would be given to you in the way that you need it. But this time, when I do these events, I have to make sure that we have breakout rooms so that individuals can go. And mm -hmm. also, you, you understand, like if there's going to be some specialized information, but for the community itself, it's so diverse that we do have to sometimes use the whole community platform, but we have to also sometimes break it down into breakout rooms because of like Zoom has different uh, plugins that you can do for different languages. So that's the only thing that I've found has caused uh, a little bit different for me because it was brick and mortar. One time we had one event and it was translated in three languages and we had English, Arabic and Spanish. And what ended up happening that day, we had over 300 plus people to watch it on Facebook Live because, and we did it by old school, it was translated in English, then translated by Arabic, by, by a community member. This is key. Having community members who are stakeholders, who are highly trusted in the community is so advantageous. When you Good wanna point. talk about, you have, to, you have to have that respectability because those individuals are the ones who are actually your liaison back into not just that neighborhood, but then you start going into this, the other groups that fit further into the community and how they are negotiating. I want to go back to what you were talking about as far as like growing food. Um, where I live in Dorchester, we have a very large um, Vietnam, Vietnamese community. Mm -hmm. And just watching how they have used their homes for food over the last 15 years is like, there is no manicured lawn you know, and nobody's bothering them about like, you know, you got to have a certain permit. Like I, sometimes I read about these stories in Florida where they say, oh, you, these people took 20 years to get, you know, a, a permit to pass yeah. agriculture. People in this community where I live, um, we've learned a lot from the Vietnamese community because now people are like saying, hey, maybe I can grow stuff in barrels. And they, mm -hmm. they're literally using their all around their house to grow different things. It's not about landscape. beautiful uh, tulips. <laughs> yeah, well, no, beautiful yeah, landscapes. That's how we. That's how we gotta you know, start to look at things. Is is you know bringing it back to the household, bringing it back home, and the amount of 
impact that the industrial agricultural complex has on the planet and on public health is massive. And, and as cities, this is an opportunity again to re, you know, reignite local economies and keep that dollar in our local neighborhoods and, and give us purpose. And so, you know, fleet, you know, fleet farming really started to attack the residential lawn because it's the number one farmed crop in the country is sod, St. Augustine grass, number one farmed crop. And we're also losing about 3,000 acres of that every single day to development daily 3000 wow. acres daily of agricultural lands to development so the question becomes looking out a couple decades from now where are we actually going to meet our food needs we have to bring it back into our neighborhoods and encourage people to start growing food on the side of their lawn or as a couple fruit trees in their front lawn these are things that cities i think are obligated to start to push forward and they help public health and they help the economy and they help the environment i mean again triple bottom line win across the board Thanks. Uh, Dan, we had a few questions. Your eyes are better than mine. Do you want to take a few of the questions? We've got about 10 minutes left from the team. Yes? These reflect an improvement in vision, but not necessarily a correction <laughs> in vision. All right. Okay. <laughs> no, I got it. I got it for you. Okay. Um, have, uh, so one question came in from uh, Chris Carrick, who's with, uh, with uh, a regional planning body up in Syracuse, New York. Okay. Um, uh, I have you participated in scenario planning as a way of drawing out the implications of overlapping and mutually reinforcing crises? Um, so, mm -hmm. for example, what if Boston or Orlando are hit by a hurricane or major storm during a pandemic? So mm -hmm. we had a we had a whole webinar about this, but are you yeah. seeing that there's an increased or renewed focus on that right now, or? Um, sure. I'll, I'll I'll definitely speak on that one. Uh, that was one of the things uh, that that was brought up. Um, all the tabletops that we do, uh, the first thing they love to do is take away your electricity, and mm -hmm. they love to take that away and then ask the question: business continuity. So business continuity is not just based on your office business. Business continuity is based on families. What are the family's business continuity and i think that we have to work a little bit more on this sustainability from the family side of the house right having them create their own little tabletops all right mm. because see here's the thing i i love watching and i and i do this i love watching when they they evacuate from florida you see everybody get in their cars and they're heading to Atlanta, <laughs> Atlanta, Georgia, or to Georgia, right? That's where they're going. Atlanta gets it, <laughs> right? <laughs> but what happens is when you say evacuation in Boston, um, the question comes like, where are we going? Some of the folks have actually, you know, they want to know where are we actually going to be going? And so uh, the mutual aid over the last couple of years the city of Boston has, um, uh, they, they're working with all of these other neighborhood um, organizations, not neighborhood, neighboring cities, so that we can really have a real robust uh, evacuation plan. But also uh, there was funding that came out for displaced individuals due to climate. Mm -hmm. And this is very, 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 very important that you know, we received the funding for this, and this is actually going to allow uh, the city of Boston and all the neighboring uh, uh, towns to really look at the displacement of people due to climate. And I know that you deal with that on a regular basis in Florida. This is something that's really, really new to the New England area, especially in this area. And so I think it's important that. Uh, that we look at tabletops, business continuity, not just for the level of what we're looking at for our offices, but business continuity is actually taking place right now, every day in those homes. At least they're actually, they're, you know, it's a, it's a fancy word, but they've been, they're doing it right now. And so to actually uh, embrace them and let them know how successful, how successful they have been during a pandemic, no schools, and being able to survive just in this last month. Mm -hmm. Let's clap. 
Yeah. Okay, so let's clap to all of them how successful <laughs> because it really <laughs> has been something that we didn't put on the table for them. And we're seeing them be very resilient. We've seen them do business yeah. continuity. And I and I think that we need to really tap into that, like uh with adding these other injects, you know? Yep. All right, okay. Chris, you have a follow-up, and I want to get to um, see if we have time for uh, one excellent. or two more questions. That was excellent, Nancy. You know, four quick points that I wrote down that I think are important to share. One is we are collaborating very closely with our regional planning council, uh, and we've established, lifted up back in October of 2019, uh, a historic effort to, to bring a regional resilience collaborative together of governments. And now we have over 30 governments in East Central Florida that have now come together five counties, 20 different cities, transportation planning organizations, and others uh, around this notion of resilience. We've all passed a memorandum that outlines our objectives and goals. And we're beginning to look at some of the things that you mentioned here around our vulnerabilities and, and hazards and risks to the region. So we're beginning to do, we've lifted up these working groups. We have a climate vulnerability and risk assessment now being expanded beyond climate under COVID to really look across the board at what those risks are. We're looking at uh, green, blue, and gray infrastructure and what that assessment currently looks like. Uh, we're also looking at, uh, from an equity and health perspective, have a working group and even regional greenhouse gas emissions, um, uh, the way that kind of Washington, D.C. Metro does through their, their COG and their, their council on governments. Yeah. Um, so we're beginning to, to, to look at that regionally and start to look at not just one hazard, but how, do, how does one complement or, or, you know, kind of build upon another and this notion of a hurricane season coming during covid is yeah. something that we are having active conversations with and about not just in the city but regionally um, two other quick points is climate migration is a huge deal for orlando if you look at the studies that have been done by yale and others orlando specifically our our location is the hot spot in the southeast uh, because of the coastal communities in florida and those in the caribbean uh, having already strong links to Orlando. And so during Hurricane Maria and Irma uh, in 2017, we had 300,000 people temporarily for over a month move to Orlando, 300,000, and 10% have stayed permanently. We now have yep. 30,000 okay. more residents because okay. of the climate crisis and the direct impacts that they have. So we're starting to work with yeah. the University of Central Florida and have lifted up an urban resilience initiative uh, a program at UCF to start to look at environmental migrants and what are the what's the criteria we have to think about what are the things that we have to start to to project out from a housing from an economy from a jobs perspective from a kid's schools perspective what happens when another 500,000 people move to Orlando in the next 50 years because of climate uh, so that's front of mind the last point is around training our communities and there's this notion around cert trainings right cert uh, yeah. really trying to go down to the neighborhood levels and equip them with the proper resilience strategies so that in time of a crisis they have direct links to the emergency operations center and and we have two-way conversation flows i think you're right nancy about needing to now integrate in addition to your traditional cert training we have to start to talk about some of these other layers that you know, as we're starting to realize, are very um, interconnected as it relates to the crisis that's being played out. Whether it's equity and low-income people disproportionately being impacted by COVID because of underlying health disparities that we've seen, uh, to you know, to other ways in which we can make them more resilient. So I love those points. And, and I just want to tell you, I'm actually the third director for the city of Quincy. Um, oh, you are. We, yeah, they actually received the funding and. Um, I came in to uh, support this uh, city and the, it was um, March 11th. And unfortunately we weren't able to do our first CERT training just because sure. of what happened with this uh, for Massachusetts. Yeah. That's good. We but need I am, more people I am like a CERT you. trainer. I totally believe in, yeah. I totally believe in CERT. We need more people like <laughs> you in those roles and getting the word out and being able to have these linkages between government and with communities in a more seamless way so that we can disseminate resources and information a lot more effectively and save people's lives. At the end of the day, this is about That's saving it. lives in times of a crisis, and, yeah. and we, can, we can continue to equip our communities better. To that point, I think it's really important that we, that we manage that distinction with, you know, engagement, education, 
and training. And those are those are very different activities, and they're all needed in very in, with with different organizational approaches to them. I've already seen Chris. We've 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 been a part of some of the early efforts to actually train professionals on on climate preparedness and action through ACOs training programs. You guys are exploring beyond doing just that. Um, but that that importance of getting down to the community level that may not necessarily be certified climate change professional training that is more like community engagement and education and awareness building um, yes. it, it's a mix of all of those different things who needs to know what who needs to be able to do what and what structures need to be in place to create the ongoing multi-directional engagement so that yeah. their that dialogue is ongoing and evolving Totally. Well, Nancy, Chris, and Dan, we are out of time. I, I'm telling you, there were so many more questions I had, so many more topics we could have covered. You both were amazing. Nancy, Chris, absolutely outstanding. There are some other questions we didn't get to. Um, I may find time to get them to you both, so maybe I can share with our listeners later um, or invite you back for future uh, webinars. So thank you, Dan. It's been a month just of amazing information that uh, I've really enjoyed these lunchtime webinars with you. Uh, maybe you'll come back and and do something here in New England with us soon. We've been teeing you up for a while. We're ready for ACO. We want to see you up here. So let, let's work on that. Okay. Well, we're going to announce some June programs with some New England specifics uh, coming shortly. So uh, yeah, thank you very much. And Chris and Nancy, thanks for joining today's program. And to the SNEP team and Joanne, thanks for the opportunity. We've really enjoyed working with you on this series. Love it. Thank you all. Thank and you maybe guys. Chris, Take care. Have you Bye. Up here. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.